you know, our sweet corn is starting to grow. And we have ooh, three and a half, four acres or so. And on two thirds of it, we have a planting. And then a few weeks later, we plant another, uh, the, the rest of, the, uh, of the, the field. And it's starting to grow. It's starting to, to come up and, and sprout. And it reminds us of hope in the future and all those types of things. But many of you have helped in our sweet corn ministry in the past. And for the last 20 years and over $160,000, we have worked and raised money to support missions and what God is doing around the world. But it can be real hard to see the big picture of things when you're doing the work. Picking a single ear of corn off the stalk doesn't seem like a big deal. Selling a single bag of a dozen ears of corn for $5 doesn't seem like a big deal. But it's part of the bigger picture of what God is doing. So if you've helped in the past, thank you. If you haven't, I would encourage you to, to try to, to maybe test it out. See how you can contribute and help us with that ministry as we try to do God's work in the world. But one of the things that we do in the sweet corn is, is you go down a row and then you pick the corn that's ripe and you keep going down the next row and subsequently until you finish picking. But then you go back and we do what we call is gleaning. And this is basically the last time we're going to go and pick corn. And so if it's ripe, we get it. But most of the corn's already been picked. We've already picked most of the corn on that first way through getting and gathering the corn. So gleaning is much faster in regards to the number of rows that you knock out each day, but you don't have as much corn there as you did the first time. But gleaning is, is a principle that we find in the Old Testament. In fact, we find in Ruth chapter 2, this is exactly what Ruth is doing. She is gleaning the field. Because if you remember in Ruth chapter 1, we have Naomi and Ruth who are both now widows. Their husbands die. Naomi's husband, Elimelech, lived in Israel in the promised land and decided to leave and go to the neighboring nation of Moab. And while he was there, one of his sons married Ruth. But Elimelech and all of his kids died. So now Naomi and Ruth were widows without children, without prospects for the future or hope for the future. And so they go back to Israel, go back to the promised land. And the only thing that they could really do is go glean a field, go gather things that were left over, things that were missed, things that the harvesters didn't get as they were going through and collecting the bulk of the crop. And so we find that Ruth is gathering the leftovers. But one of the things about God's story, and this is a blessing that we see time and time and again, is that God's leftovers are better than your banquet. God's leftovers are better than anything you can do yourself. And so in Ruth chapter 2, starting in verse 5, we see Boaz enters the scene. And Boaz is the owner of the field. And he goes to his foreman. And he says, who is that young woman over there? He's speaking about Ruth. And the foreman says, she is the young woman from Moab who came back with Naomi. She asked me earlier this morning if she could gather grain behind the harvesters. She's been hard at work ever since, except for a few minutes rest in the shelter. Boaz went over to Ruth and said, listen, my daughter, stay here in this field. Don't go anywhere else. See, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, stay with the young women working the field. See where they are harvesting and follow them. I've warned the young men not to treat you harshly and help yourself to the water they have drawn from the well when you become thirsty. Ruth fell to the ground and thanked Boaz. What have I done to deserve such kindness? I am only a foreigner. Yes, I know, replied Boaz. I also know about everything you have done for your mother-in-law, Naomi, since your husband died. I've heard how you left your father and your mother and your home to come here to live among strangers. May the Lord, the God of Israel, reward you fully for what you have done. Then Ruth replies, I hope to continue to please you, sir. You have comforted me by speaking so kindly to me, even though I'm not one of your workers. Now we find earlier in chapter 2 that Boaz is a relative of Elimelech. Remember, Elimelech is Naomi's late husband. 
And so they were relatives. We're not exactly sure how they were related, but they were somewhat related. But even though we see that there's a relation there, there is no moral or legal obligation that is implied upon Boaz. Everything he does is out of the generosity of his heart, and he's not coerced or forced or required to do anything. But in this time, it was a much more agrarian culture than we have now, much more dependent upon the land, of crops, of growing, and those types of things. While we're dependent upon those things, we have a much more separation than they had back then. But because they were so dependent upon it in that way, they also had to have the support of family and friends and the loved ones that were close to them. See, when hard times fell upon a particular person, they had to rely on other people's generosity. So when someone was having a prosperous time, it was expected for them to help others. But Boaz stands in contrast to Elimelech. Remember, Elimelech was living in Israel, in the promised land, and things didn't go well in Ruth chapter 1, so he left. He went for greener pastures. Well, during the same time, Boaz remains there. He stays there, and, and we see a steadfast trust in God that he has. But because of his faith and commitment to God and staying in the promised land that God had given Israel, we see that Boaz experiences the hesed of God. Now, hesed is the Hebrew word that we often translate as blessing or kindness. And this is seen throughout the entire book of Ruth. But it's more than just goodwill. It's wanting goodwill towards someone else and expressing your loyalty to them so that they will experience the goodness that you want. And there, there's, there's this idea that, well, we want something good to happen to somebody. Hesed is not just wanting it, it's actively helping them and committing loyalty to them. So Boaz enters the scene and then he's questioning who this Ruth person is. One of the things in Hebrew literature is that there are no hidden or ulterior motives. See, Ruth was gleaning the field. She was going there behind the harvesters and just picking up what they dropped. So, so even though she's there, even though Boaz becomes present, Ruth is not scheming in the background. She is just trying to be faithful at the task at hand. See, in the Old Testament, there, there were different laws and rules and regulations, and some of them are a little difficult to apply to today. But in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22, we find one that specifically is what Ruth is doing. And it's specifically there to help those who don't have prospects or opportunities to fend for themselves. And it says, when you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your field and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. Leave it for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. So the Old Testament had specific requirements that said, you need to make sure you provide these provisions for those who don't have much. So that's what Ruth was doing. And she told Naomi that she was going to do this. So even though Ruth and Naomi are widows, their prospects are slim at best. They're not idle. They went out and they worked. They put forth the effort that they needed. But when you think about what Ruth was doing, this was not easy or pleasant work. It was menial. It was monotonous. It might have been degrading. It was definitely tiring. Picking up just scraps along the way, hoping that she could get enough food for her and Naomi. But Boaz sees this. He sees what Naomi or what Ruth is doing, and he goes up to her. He calls her daughter. That's an interesting concept. And, and there's two options of what he may mean by that. Option one is that he could just be older, and so he's talking to someone who is younger than he is. The other option is that he is superior to Ruth. And so he is, is the one who's in control, or the one who's more dominant in that. And, and both of those probably apply to this particular setting. But even though Boaz is the one who's in control, he's the older person who has more, much more authority in this setting. He's not demeaning or degrading Ruth in any way. And that's not how Boaz functions. He doesn't look or work like that. 
But he promises Ruth protection. Now, he did not need to do this. There was nothing that required him to do something of this nature. Ruth was a non-Israelite. She was a foreigner. Even though foreigners were permitted by that Leviticus passage to glean the field, he didn't really have much other obligation to her. But he promises protection. And he he says, may the Lord reward you for that, for her faithfulness and her kindness. And with this, we see that he is trying to give Ruth has said, but because he's using has said that may the Lord bless you for your faithfulness for all you have done. Boaz is tying himself to Ruth and saying that he needs to act on this so that she might experience it. See, has said is not just good wishes. It's wanting the best for someone and working actively for that. But as we would naturally assume Ruth questions Boaz's hospitality. Why would he do this? What is the purpose for this? But Boaz shows us something that we always need to remember that I think kids naturally know. We need to treat all people with respect and dignity, regardless of of their socioeconomic status, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of how they treat other people. We need to see them through the eyes of God because God values everyone. So that's what Boaz did. That's why he promised protection. That's why he was so kind to her, because he saw who who Ruth was through the eyes of God. But he also saw her sacrifice for Naomi. He also saw how she left her home and came to Israel. But Ruth wasn't just somebody who said, you know, I'm just going to live in somewhere else. I'm going to go assimilate to a different place. Well, she did assimilate. She did sacrifice and leave her home. It was more than just a token individual changing locations. Ruth becomes a vessel in which God uses to bring redemption. And the story of Ruth, it's interwoven with how God is working in and through people. So we find with Ruth that God's Leftovers are better than your banquet. Even though she could only get scraps, even though Ruth was a foreigner, maybe not as thought of, or highly thought of as other people, God was able to use her. Her standing was low. What she had to offer from a societal standpoint wasn't very high. And for all intents and purposes, Boaz had a greater obligation to his fellow Israelites than to this person from Moab. But with Boaz, we see the kindness that has said that he displays, that he recognizes the value that God has placed in all people. Even though Ruth was a foreigner, someone born somewhere else, Boaz was willing to display has said towards her. But, but when we think about this context of what's happening, uh, the Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22, where it talks about not harvesting all of your fields so the poor and the foreigners can get some grain. We see that the Old Testament, even though we see it as rigid and ritualistic at times, and, and we see all these laws and it makes it difficult for us to how do we apply that today? We see the Old Testament is full of God's said, of his blessing, of his kindness towards us. We may not always see it, but it's there. It's prevalent throughout the entire Old Testament. And we see this in Ruth and Boaz. So Ruth is, is working the field. And at mealtime, Boaz calls out to Ruth and says, Come over here and help yourself to some food. You can dip your bread in the wine. So she sat with the harvesters, and Boaz gave her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and still had some left over. When Ruth went back to work, Boaz instructed his workers, let her gather grain right among the shreves without stopping her, and pull out some heads of barley from the bundle and drop them right in front of her. Let her pick them up and don't give her a hard time. Boaz invited her to the meal. Again, we see... Boaz is extending generosity and kindness to Ruth. 
that there was no requirement or expectation that he would do so. But he also takes initiative. Now, Ruth didn't have any authority or credibility to initiate anything in their relationship or their friendship. She has no standing, but Boaz does, and he takes the initiative. And so part of what we may be questioning, is there a romantic love brewing here? Is there something that's beginning to stir that is kind of working in the backgrounds? Maybe neither one of them see it yet. But regardless if it's romantic or if it's not, we see love is at the core of who Boaz is. So he loves Ruth, not because of anything particular, but because he values who she is as an individual. He goes above and beyond what was required of him by the law. Even though the Old Testament said that she should be allowed to glean the field, to go get some of the scraps, some of the leftovers, Boaz went above and beyond what was required because he acted out of love. And he gave her food. He invited her to the table and actively gave her food. Nothing required that he would do this. This was an act of generosity that was above and beyond anything that was expected. Not only did Ruth have food, she had leftovers. So it's not even as though Boaz gave her just a token, small bits of food. He gave her a lot. So in this, again, we see that God's leftovers are better than our banquet. Ruth didn't have anything, but God was blessing her through Boaz. But Boaz continues to go above and beyond. He told his workers to be kind to her. He'd already told them not to treat her roughly, but now he basically says, make it easier for her. Not in a way that's degrading her, but a way that is helping her and benefiting her. They were to actively drop grain so Ruth could pick it up, so she could gather more, so she could have some. And in this, and as the story continues to unfold, we'll find that Boaz also contrasts Naomi. Naomi hasn't been mentioned much in this chapter, in Ruth chapter 2. But as things continue to unfold, we see Naomi begins to act sometimes rashly and desperately. Now, we have to be fair. Ruth and Naomi are widows. They don't have many prospects or options. So desperate times call for desperate measures. But in contrast to acting like that, Boaz exhibits grace, grace and patience and duty and responsibility to help others. And this concept of has said this covenantal loyalty and goodness that he displays towards Ruth and eventually Naomi. Well, Na- Ruth worked in the field all day gathering barley, and she filled an entire basket or an ephah. She carried it to her mother-in-law, Ruth, and she also gave her the roasted grain that was left over from her meal. Naturally, Naomi was a little uh, just surprised and curious as to what happens? She said, where did you get all this grain? Where did you work today? And Naomi said, may the Lord bless the one who helped you. And Ruth told her, the man who helped me is named Boaz. May the Lord bless him, Naomi said. He is showing kindness to us and to your late husband. That man is one of our closest relatives, one of our kinsmen or family redeemers. Now, a basket for an ephah at this time was uh, around three-fifths of a bushel. Now, you may be impressed by that, uh, that I know how, how much an ephah is in regards to a bushel, but I actually have no idea how much a bushel is. Uh, some of you may be more equipped to know how much uh, a bushel is of, of different types of produce, uh, but it was about 25, maybe 30 pounds worth of grain, which is a significant amount. And so in this time, they could probably make 25 to 30, maybe 35 loaves of bread with that grain. So for someone who had nothing and spent no money getting it, this was a big deal for Ruth and Naomi. So in this story, we begin to see God's provisions are starting to shine through. God is starting to turn the tides, I guess you would say, and help Ruth 
Ruth and Naomi when they really don't have much hope to begin with. So as you can imagine, Ruth goes to Naomi and, and shows her all of the grain that she gathered. Now, Ruth, remember, was in a foreign country. This was not a place she was accustomed to being. So her whole world essentially was connected through Naomi. So she went to Naomi and gave her what she had. Now, in, in chapter one of the story, Naomi has zero hope. None. She is distressed and distraught. She actually tells people to change her name and start calling her Mara because she is bitter and broken. Naomi means sweet and goodness. And she's like, I can't be called Naomi anymore. I need to be called something that's more um, uh, descriptive of what I am going through right now. Naomi has all this anxiety, all this impatience. But she sees what Ruth has brought, sees all this grain, hope begins to stir. She has some reservations. She has some concerns. She's not ready to quickly celebrate. She's excited for what they have. Then again, she also recognizes that those things will only last a certain while. In this moment, Naomi begins to see ways that they can overcome their poverty-stricken situation, that they have hope that there's something different, something better. She begins to put some things in motion as we move on to chapter 3 next week. But she makes a statement about who Boaz is, and his kindness and generosity is great, and it's, it's obvious and it's clear that he is being kind and generous. But Naomi refers to him as a kinsman or family redeemer. He was one of the nearest relatives to them. See, at this time, if a man died, it was the responsibility of his brother to marry his widow so that the brother would carry on his deceased brother's family line, but also protect his property and his possessions. But since... Naomi had no more sons. Ruth had no one to marry. No one that could be the redeemer for her and her family. But Boaz is now on the scene. He may be the one that can redeem and restore the family line of Elimelech. Now, in Israel's history, they lived in this area called the Promised Land. And it, they viewed it as their inheritance because God gave it to them. So when a piece of property was sold to another person, it was only sold for so long, and it would eventually revert back to the original family. And this was because it was God's gift to the family. It wasn't just this inanimate object or inanimate piece of ground that could be used with, for whatever purpose. So Boaz might be the person who can come and redeem and restore and be the kinsman redeemer for the family of Elimelech and continue his legacy. So we see this Hesed of Boaz coming through again and again. Even though they don't always see it, even though Ruth and Naomi are going through life probably stressed because they don't know what the future is going to hold. God's has said is working in the background. So I can say to us, I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know the prospects of the future for you. I don't know what you're going through or the stresses and anxiety and the frustrations in your life. But God's has said is working in the background. His unconquering goodness is working in your life and it's moving to help fulfill his purposes in you. And so even though we may not see it, God is working. And in the story of Ruth, we see that God's leftovers are better than your banquet. We may be disappointed with what's before us, but God is working. In this story of Ruth, we see oftentimes the results of what happens when people try to do things their own way. Elimelech left Israel, left the promised land because the grass was greener over there. He rejected God and God's provisions in his life. When we do that, we leave ourselves open to going through life without God's has said. 
One of the things that we can be challenged by today, particularly with Boaz, is we can be challenged to be part of God's Hased in this world. Because when Hased is displayed by humans, by people, it's evidence of God's Hased. This is not just some earthly thing that we created. It is God's unconquering blessing in our life. It's his loyalty to us, his commitment to help us not just uh, survive, but to thrive. Now, this is not about the prosperity gospel. Let's make sure we're clear on that. It's not about making, having a bigger bank account, a bigger home, a better car, nicer clothes, whatever that looks like. This is about experiencing God's goodness in this world here and now. Naomi experienced God's has said through Ruth and Boaz. They become avenues that God is able to pour out his blessing in Naomi's life. And we have these three people in this story. We have Ruth, who is the outsider that's brought in, that becomes a vessel that God uses to bring his redemption and his sin. We have Boaz, who is an example of steadfast commitment to God, and God is able to work through him and bring his sin. And then we have Naomi, the person who is bitter, who is broken, who has no hope, and God is able to bring his sin to her as well. We think of this story, and we wonder, did Ruth enter... Boaz's fields by chance, or was it God's direction? Because throughout the whole story of Ruth, Ruth almost seems to be oblivious as to what's happening. She's kind of along for the ride, and sometimes that's what it is. We're along for the ride, and God is working in the background. See, Ruth shows us that all we need to do is be faithful at the task at hand. She was gleaning the field, and because of that, she had a divine appointment where God brought forth his ascend through this man named Boaz. God invites you to participate in his plan of redemption. He invites you to participate in what he's doing in the world. And when we do that, we'll experience his ascend. Not sure what you're going through. But I promise you, God does. And I promise you that God is working in the background to bring forth His chesed in your life. Don't be disappointed by what's in front of you because God's leftovers are better than your banquet. No matter what you can concoct, no matter the plan you can implement, no matter the intelligence and abilities that you have, God's leftovers are always better than your banquet. So whether things are great, God's got better for you. Or things aren't going well, God's got better for you. Because God has to said for you at the core of who he is, God's leftovers are better than your banquet.